Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales of the Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Taimor Tariq, who, interestingly, has been in the sales ops game for seven years, recently took a sabbatical out of sales operations into a role in customer experience, but then just seven months into that sabbatical came right back. So he's back. He's back in the team. Uh, Taimor, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to kick off by understanding first how you seven years ago moved into sales operations and then if you could also cover why you decided to take that sabbatical uh, and then why you decided to come back yeah sure so i think uh, uh like most people i think no one actually you know, starts off their career in sales sales, sales ops this is something they usually stumble into, stumble into and a similar thing happened to me as well i started off my career in sales i did that for almost a year i was working at a company uh in canada called uh infotech and at that moment they were going through this transition of remodeling the sales model, as well as changing the go to mark strategy. And at that moment, they needed some help in terms of someone to come in, in assistance since like, you know, into the go to mark strategy, doing some analysis, and there was this need. And I think I was lucky, very lucky at that time to have a manager who really pushed me towards that role. So starting off, I was uh, doing it more on a part-time basis while still doing my sales job, looking at, let's say, analysis on, uh, you know, your, your conversion rates, uh, helping out building our territory models, uh, and eventually that moved into a full-time role. And that was my move into the world of sales ops. And I think, uh, and um, like, it's it's been an awesome journey so far. And like, that's the rest of history. And you decided I, to to move out of sales operations in so, in 2019. So I would say it's. Uh, I would say in my journey in sales operations went through different phases where I started like after, let's say, doing reporting and anal- uh, analytics, I moved into more of, uh, you know, a sales force admin role where I really got technical, you know, learn sales force in and out, started looking after tech stacks. And then, you know, when my manager at uh, Achievers left, there was an opening for a sales ops manager. So I started getting this whole holistic view. And I think after spending that much time in sales ops, you know, every day you're looking at Salesforce. Like first thing you do is open, like log in, like go to work, open Salesforce. And like, and I think at that moment I was looking to see, hey, is there something else out there that, you know, I'm good at or, you know, I should be exploring. And an opportunity came up uh, to move to Boston and try something in the customer experience world. I hadn't done it before. And yeah, I thought it was a great opportunity for, for me to jump. So that's how I kind of transitioned out of the world of sales ops. And once I was there, uh, I would say I was kept, I kept remembering, hey, like, you know, but this is something that is, is still my true calling. It's only when you move out of something, you realize, hey, how, how like, it's, it's in your genes. It, it's, it's part of you. And it's so hard to take that out from you. And I was like, I started missing that more. And that's how it kind of, Kind of like a farm farm next role uh, here at Salix, uh, where I am the uh, head of revenue operations for them. Got it. I mean, so logging into Salesforce every day and not enjoy I can't imagine how you wouldn't enjoy that. So let's move to today, head of revenue ops at Salix. Can you share quickly how many sales reps you're responsible for and how many people are in the rev of the team? Yeah, so the way we let's say structure the rev of teams is. Uh, you have marketing ops, sales ops, and uh, CS ops. So those are the three pillars. In terms of, let's say, salespeople, we are around 10. Uh, and we have, like, we have uh, in the US and EMEA all together. And then we have around, like, six CSMs as well. Got it. And so it, it's quite interesting, right? Because in sales and CS, you have one-to-one interaction between a rep and a customer. In marketing, you have one-to-many. So I, I guess you your function is not responsible for, say, working directly with the email marketing manager, right? You're more supporting the CS reps and the sales reps. Uh, correct. And I think where, let's say, the marketing piece comes in is the marketing art- automation is still being the owner right. of like the marketing automation tool and you know the lead flow that comes from what marketing works for, the demand that they generate, making sure the process flows smoothly to the sales. It's the handoff, only the handoff between marketing and sales. Got it. And have Celix given you somebody else in your team to help you with these three departments? 
So right now, I we like one when I joined, we already had a Salesforce, uh, sorry, a, a sales ops analyst. So he's still on my team. Right now, I'm hiring for a marketing operations manager. Oh. Uh, and at the same time, we have someone who works part time in CS ops in, in a way like they're CSM, but also Got helps it. out on the operational side. So two point five resources right now in RevOps, but seem to be three point five. Um, if you share the job spec, if you have one for the marketing ops role, we can put it in the blog post below this episode. So hopefully, maybe generate some some leads. Um, that would be awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, can you? Because you haven't been at Celtics for that long, but could you share something that you have done or the RevOps team have done that has significantly boosted productivity, either the sales reps or the support reps? So I would say it's uh, like like you said, I've only been there for three months. So there's a lot of lots of work that still needs to be get done. Uh, oh, like I think one of the things that we did, like or like when I came in, one of the things we noticed was there was definitely, uh, let's say, the link between marketing and sales was broken in a sense of there's not a lot of alignment in between the numbers, right? So when you talk about marketing was reporting something else and sales was not seeing those numbers, right? They were reporting, hey, we're generating X amount of leads and sales was not getting the same results, right? So there was this miscommunication. So uh, I think the first step was just aligning on those definitions. Hey, what is a qualified lead? What is an MQL? What is, you know, what's the standardized process, getting everybody on the same page. So that was, I think, uh, the first step. The second thing, which I think we did pretty well, is having a standardized lead to opportunity process. And I think in our case, we have a team that's based in the US and a team that's based in EMEA. Both, uh, both of them were following their different processes, doing their own little thing. And like, uh, you know, now I think fortunately we have a standardized process where we know, hey, every time a lead comes in, what's happening with it? We have standardized, let's say, statuses that they need, need to move to. They get dispositioned if they're not going to work. You know, otherwise we had like, let's say, uh, 90% of our leads were in the status of open. Like, what does that even mean? So, you know, having those standardized uh, processes of, and then building automation on top of it, which is if, let's say, our lead is in working. So, for example, if you have a lead which is assigned to a rep, the first moment they start to send out an email or a call, it all will be moved into status of working. Now, if they stop working that lead after a little while, uh, let's say we after 10 days or 15 days, it will or, or automatically get dispositioned. If it's not touched, it won't remain the same status. So like these little automation that we started build, that really, I think, gives everybody much more visibility into what's really happening on the top of the funnel. Got it. So it kind of sounds like you came in and you've been adding a lot of order to the chaos. Uh, isn't that what rev- revenue operations, sales operations is supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Um, cool. Now, question about the current times. I assume that everybody in the team has now been pushed to remote work. Yeah. And so focusing on the sales guys, is there anything that you're doing differently, like different tools or different processes you're doing to ensure that they are still fully equipped to do their job? Working from home. I think that's that's a very interesting question. I think uh, in a way we're already set up to you know support that remote work, uh, and I think what has really done is you know making sure your cadences of you know week like regular check ins has like gone up. And I think personally for me, I feel like it's right now. Even though you know some people are saying, hey, we might some people feel more productive. Personally, I feel like we are spending more time talking to each other and it's not really about having that empathy. It's, you know, every sales call that I even I've been on, on the other side, is, you know, it's the first 10 minutes is not talking about work. It's talking about, you know, making sure we remain that human connection. And I think that's also trans- translating to our work to work work conversations as well. In terms of productivity itself, I think it comes down to having those good standardized reporting and dashboards where everybody you know there's there's a shared accountability and as long as you put let's say the right uh goals in front of people they are going to you know take the right make the right decisions in order to hit those goals got it and then i have a slightly different question now on the metrics um seven years in sales ops what would you say has been your most effective sales metric to measure? Uh, my view on this is you cannot run a business just by looking at one metric, right? <laughs> Agreed. Uh, so 
uh, like what I mean by that is, let's say, if you look at new business, right? New acquisition revenue is the most important metric, right? And in order, to, but that's a lagging indicator. In order to actually get, and it can be actually, let's say, broken down into a simple equation, right? So for us, like the way I look at it is, is number of opportunity created times your average uh, win rate and times your average selling price. Your average selling price is over the period of time is going to be consistent. You can your win rate over a period of time also going to be consistent. So the only variable which I feel is the most important one is the number of new opportunities generated. Right. So for me, like coming back to this question, I feel if you're measuring uh, for the health of your growth of your business, I think the most important metric that you should be measuring should be uh, the number of new opportunities generated. Got it. And that's the leading indicator versus. Yes. But you should be measuring revenue is obviously the lagging indicator. Yes. And so you're basically saying that that's the most easy to improve because to improve the win rate, you might have to do some drastic changes and to improve the increase in deal size, you might have to like change some product. Exactly. Okay. Right. And Got it's it. also because it's a leading indicator, it's something you can take action today. Right? Yeah. So do you are you targeting all of the 10 reps on number of new ops in a month? Uh, I think it's more about having, it starts with, you know, uh, a cultural shift in terms of, you know, making sure the leaders, the managers of the reps actually, uh, you know, believe in this number. And, you know, they think this is important as well. So that, you know, it comes from top down where, uh, you know, you have as a company, a goal of how many new opportunities you should be creating uh, per month. And then you have it divided by team. And then, you know, you have it divided by reps as well. So I, yeah, so like once you have that top-down approach, then you have that visibility in terms of how each individual rep is doing against that number. You mentioned about getting the managers to believe in the metric. Did, did, did you have to do that when you joined? Or do you have any tips on how you would be able to get managers to believe in the metric? Uh, it's 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 not an easy process. It's definitely not an easy process. And I think it takes effort. It takes empathy in terms of understanding, you know, like people might have different view. It's, you know, they might be doing certain things for a long period of time. And it takes time to actually convince them or, you know, not even convince, have that conversation first about why these, what you feel is their, let's say, are important metrics and what they feel. And it's then it becomes a negotiation. Right? It's like making sure you hear what they're saying, but also, uh, you know, coming like it, it's not, it should not be me telling them, hey, we should be running a business this way, but collectively agreeing on what those metrics should be. Right. And like, so that's why it's more of a back and forth conversation. Um, final question Who has influenced or inspired you the most in sales operations? Uh, great question. I think over let's say my whole career, there have been multiple people and I feel like I've learned so much from so many uh, people I work with. Early in my career, I would say uh, there was a gentleman named Paul Ironside. He was my mentor who actually at uh, Infotech, he was hired as a consultant. And I think he really taught me how to think about business uh, in or in special sales in a very simplified manner in terms of, you know, how do you take a complex uh, business and simplify it? So the whole idea of simplification, I kind of learned from him. When I moved over to like Achievers, uh, I think Matt Maglia was my manager at that time. Like he was uh, the manager of sales ops at the time. And he, I think what I learned from him was really about how to actually deal with different stakeholders, how to, you know, talk to the CRO, how to talk to head of sales, of mar head of marketing, and, you know, have those conversations get people aligned. So those interpersonal skills, I definitely learned from him. When it comes to, let's say, now who do I like read a lot of content from? There's a gentleman named uh, Marco, Marco Savic, uh, out of Final Cake. I think his content is brilliant uh, in terms of stuff he writes about the revenue of frameworks. I've like learned so much from his content, implemented so much things he has talked about. So like that's someone I, I think like is producing great content. And I've told him that multiple times too. Yeah, a couple of people have mentioned Marco. I need to try and get him on the show, don't I? Um, uh, yep. And then just to catch the names of the other two, just so the listeners say, it was Paul. What was Paul Iron? Paul Ironside. Ironside. Cool. And then the second name I got was Matri. Uh, yeah, Matri Maglia. Matri Maglia. Oh, great. Oh, great. Cool. Awesome. 
Okay, awesome. Well, I've got a page from notes here. Um, let me just quickly share a couple of things that I, that I pulled out that I enjoyed. Um, I think that your definition of root or sale, the revenue ops, I don't think it was, I don't think that's like planned or stored in your head, but it, I think it was very true in that, that this function is here to streamline this process and bring order to the chaos. Um, the, I really like the point you're making about now with remote sales calls that actually we focus more on communicating as people, both in external sales calls, but also in internal conversations. Um, and then the leading metric at all in cutting, but then more importantly, how you get the interesting part, how you actually get people internally to believe in that metric, which you think is so important to the success of the business. So Time Walk, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This was, this was fun.